It's 100 years since the first pioneering women joined the British Armed Forces. Today, women serve alongside men, together in combat, on the front line. If you can do it and you want to do it, you should be able to. To see how much things have changed... Love it! How do I look? Five well-known faces revisit either their own... Morning, Mum. I'm the captain of H.R.S. Morning, Muncher. Mum. How sweet. Yeah. ..or a family member's military past. They just got stuck in. It was exciting. It was intense. From defending land, sea, I don't want to go that way, and air. These are the extraordinary stories of a century of women at war. She's one of our best loved small screen actresses. But over 70 years ago, June Brown took on a very different role as a recruit into the Women's Royal Naval Service known as the Wrens. I want to lie down and have a rest after doing all that here. No, no fight of fire. As she relives some of the trials and highlights of being a Wren during the Second World War. I think I danced with you once. <laughs> you might have done. <laughs> June gets a taste of modern life in the forces, challenging her own views on women's roles in the military. It's quite cool seeing the captain as a professional. It would be quite nice to get to that level and be, you know, a proper professional naval officer. And after taking a turn navigating a warship... Just... Am I all right steering over here? Yeah, that's just fine. So I don't you... want to go that yeah. way. June's appreciation of how the Navy has been transformed. I would have been perfectly capable of doing this when I was young. ...leads to a surprising change of heart. Which helped me a lot to accept that society has moved on. In 1985, June Brown took on the role that would make her a TV legend, laundrette worker Doc Cotton in EastEnders. You've got to see a doctor. I mean, we can't do no more on our own. No! You've got to, Nick. But before June's theatre and television career blossomed, she served in the Women's Royal Naval Service during the last year of World War II and the year following victory. I've got some photographs here of when I was in the Wrens. Which one shall I show you first? That is, the Wrenery is one side, uh, that side, and the pub is the other. And you could go out of the back door from the Wrenery into the door of the pub. Oh, well, this is one of my young men. I'm hanging on to his right arm. Well, you never did that, because if they met a rating, they had to salute, you see, and so you shouldn't... I should have been on the other side. And you always wore your handbag here, so you were ready to salute. In 1941, young single women began to be conscripted for roles in the war effort. Then, as more jobs needed to be filled, all fit and able women, up to the age of 60, were called up. They worked in areas like farming, industry and non-combat military roles in the forces. But June had her own reasons for choosing to become a Wren. I knew I'd be called up when I was 18, so I thought to myself, well, if I a volunteer, you know, then I can choose which service I go to. I didn't fancy the uniform of the WAF or the AT because it wouldn't have suited my complexion. So, and anyway, the Wrens, well, that was the senior service, you see. Here is a rather lovely poster of the Wren. In fact, has she got a berry on? Because that's what I had. But you see, really rather smart we were, weren't we? With a different salute, that salute. Not your hand turned round like the army. No, we, quite special we were. So I upped and joined the Wrens. You released the men to go to war. And so you were nurses, you worked in the factories, or you went into the forces. It's very interesting to me what is happening in the services now, what's happening with the Wrens. And I want to know the jobs they do, because the jobs are going to be a great deal different from the ones we did. So it'll be very interesting to see how it's changed. 
Not that I like change. <laughs> the Wrens was founded during World War I. Following massive troop losses, the War Office allowed uniformed women to take on naval support roles for the first time. They were disbanded soon after the war. But when war in Europe broke out once more in 1939, the Wrens were called upon again to help free a man for the fleet. June will be comparing her wartime experiences as a Wren with those of women serving now. And she's anticipating a very different landscape. I'm off to Portsmouth to a training camp for Wrens. Well, I think it's a training camp for Wrens. They aren't called that these days, so I'm told. And I do believe they might be training with the men. June's come to HMS Excellent, one of the Navy's oldest training establishments. She's here to meet junior warfare officer Sean English to share what she remembers of her first weeks with the Wrens. So here we have your war records. So mm. do you remember how long your training was, your basic training? I thought it was six weeks, but it turned out to be three. It just seemed an awful long time. Seems like an eternity. <laughs> yes. Where was your training? Up in, well, at Loch Lomond, on the banks of Loch Lomond. It was called Balloch. So how, how did you find the training while she was up there? Well, we did the normal things. We learned to march, we learned to salute, we learned to, what's it called when you all uh, shimmy up to each other and get in line? I forget what that's called. And route marches. Well, I didn't really like those. I wasn't a very energetic girl, really. And um, but the thing I really hated was when I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning and scrub floors, or get up at five o'clock in the morning and clean dirty, filthy, greasy tins, very big ones. I wasn't used to that, and I would have gone home, but I had too much pride to put my tail, because I, I don't, volunteered, you see. And if you could volunteer when you're 17 and a half, you could leave if you found it too much for you. But um, I didn't. Are you glad that you stuck it out? Yes, I yeah. it's only three weeks, but as I said, it felt like six. <laughs> in the century since women first took on roles in the forces, plenty of other new recruits have found their basic training something of an ordeal. When I did basic training, when I, uh, in 1988, my basic training was six weeks long. Suddenly I'm there, didn't know anybody. Um, and it's, it was just full on from the minute you got there until the minute you, you left. We did uh, PT. I wasn't very happy with that. <laughs> you're mucking in and you're doing, you know, um, duties. So yeah, it was a shock to the system, uh, but I knew it's something that I had to do. We did um, learn how to march, because none of us could march. We were all just plain young girls. We'd just joined. We didn't know what we was letting ourselves in for, really but it was uh, very good and very uh, exciting. Beds had to be made so they were so perfect. We spent hours polishing shoes. I mean, for a 17-year-old, um, that was pretty intense. I mean, we also had a lot of fun, uh, but yeah, it was very intense. At HMS Excellent, the current training for female recruits couldn't be more different from June's World War II experiences. But as part of a generation of women, who joined up so they could support the men, June's not entirely comfortable with how much things have changed. First thing we've got to do, turn it upside down to get all the pressure released. The Wrens merged with the Navy in 1993, and women are now completely integrated into the service. They train side by side with the men and are expected to do the same jobs to the same standards. What we're going to do now is don't Demonstrate what happens when you turn on the hose incorrectly, okay? Today, communications specialist Anna Fryer is among those on a refresher course, learning how to fight fires at sea. Now, I'm going to ask you uh, why you wanted to join. I don't believe it's called the Wrens anymore, am I right? No, it's just the Navy. It's just, just the Navy. Yeah, it's the Navy now. So I never ever really thought about joining the Navy. I was at college um, doing travel and tourism. 
and they came to an open day and I went um, they said oh yeah you'd be really good so I went and did all my tests and no one knew and my family knew until my 18th birthday and I said I'm joining the navy and what did they say? And my mum and dad were a bit shocked, but um, they only gave me like four weeks. They said, oh no, you're not going to last that long, because I like my home converts and stuff. But 17 years later, yeah. I'm still here. What I want to know, Anna, is what your basic training was like. I want to know if it was different from mine. I did eight weeks up in HMS Rally in Torpoint in Cornwall. You do um, NMT, which is Naval Military Training, so you have a rifle and you do rifle drills and shoot yeah. and things yeah, like that. Shoot, yeah. You have to um, learn um, all the different slangs, like port and starboard is left and right. And you do obstacle courses, a fitness test. And you have to do a 2.4 kilometer run. Oh, dreadful. I wouldn't have passed any of those times. If I ran up a hockey field, I was exhausted <laughs> at school. <laughs> no, we just were tested when before we came in accepted our heart rate and everything and then as long as we were reasonably healthy we yeah. were in so we did none of that at all you seem to have done so much you've got two children yes i have got two children you've got a, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old and how do you feel about leaving them behind when you're on your ships it's hard but at the end of the day you've got a job to do and why I'm, have you got a job to do because i signed up uh, for 22 you prefer years. to do a job outside the home. Well, oh yeah, I think work. nowadays, like there was um, females used to stay at home, didn't they? Yeah. And look after like the husbands and the well, children. That was a job. And that was a job. Yes. It's quite a hefty it is an job. important job, but like nowadays, I think that females want to be equal. But we're not equal, are we? Years ago, when you first joined up, obviously the Wren supported the the males, exactly. but now we are hand in hand. I don't like the idea. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. We're side by side. We work side by side with each yeah. other. Females can do the same job as what a male can do. To prove it, Anna shows June the next part of her training, tackling a blaze aboard ship. So, what I'd like to do now is take it off the hooks, place it on your back, tighten up the straps. So fast. We have to be. They only get two minutes to do this in a real instant at the start. Place the mast, chin first, Onto your face, take a deep breath and activate the set. Well, I want to lie down, down and have a rest after doing all that here. No, no, fight a fire. Oh, it's so complicated. They look like Daleks. Well, I don't know. I'm just going to go. What is this? This it matches your scarf. Oh, how charming. <laughs> June's placed in the safe hands of Warrant Officer Kath Wojcik. So what happens now? I'm coming with you. You're coming with me. Right. We'll go to the top of the uh, top of the unit. Yeah. Next stop, the exercise area where fire simulations take place. And everything that they've talked about, uh, they're going to put into practice with a real fire in the units. So they have to go down that hatch. Oh, yeah. They go down. Uh, we'll have a fire they and then we'll see what's fire. Yeah, the, yeah. That's right, you need your heart though. What's going to happen now? Fires on ships spread at lightning speed, so have to be dealt with very quickly. They've got eight minutes to get dressed in all their firefighting rig. Although unheard of in June's day, all of the Navy's 3,500 female personnel must train in fire drills like this. So they're on their way down now. Uh, and you'll see Adam and that will come back up. <laughs> After 10 minutes of intensive firefighting, Anna comes up for air. It's all dark down there and oh. smoking, and you can see the flames. Yeah, you actually see flames. Yeah. But it's frightening. No, I mean, because. Because this is a training environment anyway, you get used to what it's going to be like if eventually you go into a fire on a warship. So it's not, it's not frightening. No, it's you're learning, you're, you're learning when all the skills. There's a real fire, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a hundred years since women officially joined the military, frontline combat duties are now open to them. But June remains to be convinced that this is a good thing. Something that requires a weight and strength. Uh, well, some women have got it, but most women haven't. I just don't know where the femininity has gone. 
I think that's what disturbs me. I like to know that there are men and women and they're not equal and all the same. Oh, I wouldn't like to be going down, <laughs> down below to fight a fire, not at all, dear. No, I'd be looking for the nearest fire exit. After completing basic training, World War II Wrens were placed in different categories according to their skills and experiences. June became a cinema operator, playing training films to troops, detailing what happens during military operations. Navy veteran Eddie Gaines watched the kind of films June showed during the war. He joined up age 18 and worked on landing vessels used to take troops ashore during battle, seeing action in Normandy and the Far East. Oh, Lord, yes, it's 16 mil, I think. Hmm. It's different looking from what I did because we had much smaller reels because our machines wouldn't take something that size. Yeah. It, let's get it sort of... Where's it gone? Oh, it's in a right old mess here. It's coming to pieces. I showed these films uh, to train uh, the sailors. Go that way. Yes. So things like uh, how to survive at sea, how to survive in the jungle. I have to sit in my little box with a little window and yeah. throw a training films like that. And then they'd pass me through their tobacco and their papers and I'd make them ticklers. Ticklers? Yeah, roll-ups, <laughs> you see. So I never watched the film, so I was too busy making them cigarettes. So they put me in the category of a cinema operator. So I just showed the films. I released a sailor to go and fight and uh, not to waste his time showing other people training films. And that, that's how it happened. Where did you go after your training? I went to HMS Armadillo, which Never was up it. in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Near so, Dunoon? Yes, near Dunoon. I, I did training in Dunoon. Uh, did you? In combined operations, yeah. yeah. I used to go dancing in Dunoon. I think I danced with you once. <laughs> you might have done. <laughs> yeah. What kind of time did you have there? Did you enjoy it? Well, I did enjoy it because we were far away from the war and we used to go as a group. We'd climb the mountain behind us and go down to Loch Egg. We'd put 10 bob in the kitty and then we'd have boiled egg and toast and then we'd go and sit in the bar and have whiskey and chaser till the money ran out. <laughs> then we went very cheerfully home. I feel very guilty about it because other people had a very nasty time in the well, war. Well, no, everybody you had to make... You had to do what you had yeah. to at the time, but yeah. it didn't mean to say you've got to be miserable. Eddie and June are here to watch a rare surviving example of the kind of World War II training film June used to show. The coastline is divided into sectors on the map. I wonder where they made the this film. then begins to clear the exit. Mm. Looks a bit like Stud on the Beach. Uh -huh. Films like these were designed to prepare recruits for combat and help to standardise training across the military. The loud hailers are used to give orders to personnel on the beach which must be kept clear at all times. It all sounds so easy. Also, each of these units are sighted yeah. and used by the beach group commander. I presume. There's no defences at all shown, is there? I mean, our beaches were mined. No, no beach obstacles. <laughs> no. Regiment. But they could never fully convey the chaos and horror of a genuine war scenario. As Eddie was to discover during the real life drama of the 1944 D Day landings. As you went out of the harbour, you'd never see another sea like it. A great armada was coming up the channel, all heading east, yes. because the rendezvous point was five miles due south of Ventnor. Uh -huh. And there, That's the Isle of Wight. Yes, and the Ventnor. There, there was a five mile wide channel that had been swept by minesweepers. Uh -huh. Yes. The 25 mile offshore, there was the, the ships all split to their respective beaches. Yeah. And we had to go to the American beach of Omaha Beach. Yes. Tasked with getting American troops onto Omaha Beach, Eddie witnessed firsthand the terrible losses that took place there. And of course, many of the guys were sick, seasick. Exactly. We only had 17 guys, I think, on board us, GIs. But the idea of them was to remove the beach obstacles. Most of the killing went on yeah. on the beach there. Mm. It was a killing zone. Yeah. We dropped our ramp 
a killing zone. A killing yes. zone. We were dropped ramp on uh, bodies. Yeah. It was terrible. In fact, I, at the time, I used to always think that my whole life was a bonus because I got away with it. Yeah. I was thinking, Eddie, was the part I played in it as a cineop in, of any value to the war effort, do you think? It was fantastic. Jobs like that, like you did, released men. Yes, that was Well, like myself, to, to go and... Yeah, that was our function, really, yes. to take the place of the men yeah. so they could fight. And it was done yeah. well. Meeting you like this and finding out all the things that you and a great host of ladies, they all came in and did all their, all their effort no, to no, the that war was nothing effort. compared with what you did. Every man appreciated the big effort that the women made. I'm quite sure that we all did. Talking to Eddie has made me feel quite humble in a way. I'm glad that we were able to support them. But what we sent them out to <laughs> was not very pleasant. It has affected me quite a lot, quite honestly. I, I, I watched that film and, oh, it seemed so simple, didn't it? It was all <laughs> painting by numbers, really. This is what you do and this is what you do. But it doesn't happen like that. Plans go awry. In World War II, no women in any British forces were directly involved in combat. So all naval war vessels at the time were exclusively male. But the Wrens excelled in numerous support roles. And they were easily identified by their distinctive, highly coveted uniform that June had found so attractive when she first signed up. So she's come to the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth to see if an original outfit from the 1940s still has the same appeal. This is an example of one of the Second World War uniforms that we've got in the collection. And this is the sort of thing that would have been worn by most ratings for when they're on parades and things like that. You know, the, the Wrens um, were particularly admired because they did have a sort of more streamlined shape and were seen to be a little bit more fashionable than um, some of the other service uniforms. And on the table here, we've, we've got the handbag. And so this was something that was introduced after quite a campaign by the Wrens themselves, who hadn't had a bag at the start of the war. They had nothing. They were sticking all oh. their lipsticks and everything in their uniform and pockets. Well, there weren't Jesus. many pockets either, John. No, there was absolutely. Nothing. As so, far yeah. as I know, there was nothing on the skirt, but there were two pockets here. Here we are. Yes, yeah. So Which are not very no. deep. No, absolutely not. So, um, so that's why the Wrens were campa campaigning to, to get a handbag. It was amazing they made a fuss like that. Many girls did choose to um, purchase a sort of leather version, but um, this is the cloth version. Uh, Does the zip still work? You need a bit of Vaseline <laughs> on this time, yeah. I'd have hardly got my cigarettes in that, <laughs> would I? As well as the outerwear, um, Wrens were issued with, with underwear as well, uh, and so you got complete outfit. Um, some of it was less glamorous than the outer uniform, though, and we got an example of All of it was less glamorous. <laughs> the bra was, had a deep band and looked m like an old lady's, you know, sort of very stiff, and nobody wore that, and nobody wore these appalling drawers. But, I mean, I wouldn't have put those on, maybe. <laughs> But no, they no. were like that. They were called passion killers. Absolutely. What did you call them? Or blackouts. That blackouts. Was about, yeah. You know, we <laughs> called them passion killers, which are not very nice. And uh, mine was certainly not any bigger than that. But uh, this must have been a very... No, they came just above the knee, oh. yeah, so... Oh, they go right down there, darling, about just above the kneecaps. Could wear some cycling shorts <laughs> nowadays, yeah. couldn't you? The reasons for for Wrens wearing the uniform is to develop that group identity. And in wartime as well, it's a way of showing your patriotic duty by saying that you are doing your bit for the war effort as well, rather than just um, in a civilian role too. By the time June became a uniform recruit, 
Wrens worked in nearly 200 different roles. They may not have fought on the front line, but they covered almost every other aspect of naval life, including some truly pioneering positions. Alongside traditional responsibilities as cooks and clerics, Wrens became dispatch riders, carrying vital messages through blitz-hit cities. They also maintained and loaded torpedoes and ran supplies to warships. June may have doubts about the impact of her role in the war, but Wrens like Dorothy Runicles saw themselves as trailblazers in jobs previously considered only suitable for men. Oh, you're a pretty woman. I was, I was just jolly looking, like you. <laughs> I was beautiful, if you don't mind. All right. <laughs> In 1943, aged 18, Dorothy was selected to train as an air radio mechanic, looking after communications equipment for planes in the Navy's fleet air arm. They put me on this wonderful course that they made a two-year course into a nine-month one. Here we all are in this course in Chelsea, at Chelsea College, and we did this air radio course which introduced us to radio. So that's because I'd studied physics and maths at oh, school. Oh, you were clever. Well, it was a chance. In those days, not many girls did that, you see. No, I know. We were to check and absolutely make good, repair, fit, yes. test, air test. All the radio. The, the equipment yeah. for communication. But when Dorothy took up her first position on the Isle of Man, she encountered some resistance. I reported to the air radio officer. So I said, I'm your air radio mechanic. He looked at me, he said, what? He was expecting a man. Oh, yes. And I could see the disappointment. What year was this? 1944 by now. Yes. And he said, can you type? I need a secretary. I said, no, I can't type. <laughs> anyway, he kindly allowed me to do the job by saying, well, you start at once because we've been waiting for you. You're late. Yes. So eventually he forgave me for that, gave me a bicycle, and he said, you go straight to the air radio office. The chap who was on duty looked absolutely exhausted, and he said to me, oh, thank goodness someone's come. He said, I've just got to go and sleep. He would had to do two or three duties successively. Yeah. So I said, well, what do I do? He said, oh, well, here's the book. It's all in there. Oh. And so my very first job was a night duty. And uh, so I thought, well, I can do this. Dorothy, how did it change your life being in the Wrens? It gave me opportunities to do things that I wouldn't have the chance to do. We saw women pilots, women mechanics, women doing all sorts of jobs they weren't intended. I never imagined I would be doing what I was doing in those years. But there's still women going into the Navy, doing the jobs that we did, so we did break through for them. Many women, like Dorothy, would say their military service, whether in the Navy, Army or the RAF, resulted in extraordinary personal experiences, which have shaped their entire lives. It broadens your minds. You stick up for yourself, you start to... Um being independent and them sort of things. In mean, the three years that I was in the forces, I did everything I wanted. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. I enjoyed every single minute of it. I just wanted to make some of myself. I didn't want to just stay at home and say either, just get a job in a factory. I'd, I'd done that and, you know, I wanted to make something of myself. And I wanted to venture and I wanted to do different things and anything that was offered to me, um, I would say yes to It was a marvellous experience for me, wonderful. Best thing that ever happened. To be away and to mix with other girls and be independent, I had to give orders <laughs> as a corporal, which I was a bit laid back, but we got through it anyway. The service of the Wrens proved vital over the course of World War II. And the same was true of the female recruits to the Army and the Air Force demonstrating beyond doubt women's ability to serve their country in support of the men. Following the Allied victory in 1945, they were celebrated for their contribution to Britain's defences. And four years later, the Wrens were made a permanent part of the Navy. But their ambitions didn't stop there. Over the next decades, as their roles developed, they wanted full equality and the opportunity to take on combat duties. 
In 1990, they were able to go to sea on operations for the very first time. And three years later, the Rens were disbanded, as its 4,500 women were fully integrated into the Navy. Today, women are an essential part of ship's companies. So June's been invited aboard HMS Mersey, moored on the Thames, to see firsthand how men and women in the Navy now work side by side. Sub-Lieutenant Fran Howes is one of four women on the mixed crew of this patrol vessel. So we're in what part? So this is called two deck. So this is the main corridor that runs through the ship. Oh, so you go, if you come in here, this is my cabin. We've got a double bunk so yeah. we can have a visitor. <laughs> so I've on got a spacious loo and shower. And a shower as well. Yeah. So on Mersey, all of you'll get the maximum of two people per cabin. Yeah. So you'll just have one cabin mate throughout your time on board and they all have ensuite bathrooms as well. Yeah. So actually it's quite a lot like a university cabin or something like that, you yeah. know. <laughs> the crew patrol UK waters for at least four weeks at a time and up to 200 miles into the Atlantic Ocean. How many decks are there then? So there's um, three decks essentially on board. So this is the bridge. So this is where day to day we navigate and drive the ship from. This bit here is where you actually drive the ship. Uh -huh. So the helmsman. The helmsman was the one who. And now you drive ships. I don't know. <laughs> Might as well be in a car. As an agile vessel of the Navy fleet, it's also used to escort foreign warships passing through UK waters. These are our navigation terminals. From here, you can um, you can zoom in and out, and you can see from there that dot there. Yeah. That's where we are. And all that mendy bit of the river, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. That's so yeah, it's yeah. called a WECDIS, so Warship Electronic Chart Display Information System. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you um, confused me with I all know. these terms. I'm sorry. I c confuse myself sometimes. In the past, women were primarily recruited to release men for frontline duties. Now they serve alongside them. Since joining the Navy two years ago, Fran has worked her way up to become a junior warfare officer. But she'd like to progress even further. Now, this is an offshore patrol boat, isn't it? So, uh, what is your life like on it? What do you do? How so, do you find it? On an offshore patrol vessel, we'll go out for sort of two weeks at a time, come back in for a couple of days refuel, and then go out for two weeks again. For me, I'm in the watch rotation, so I do bridge watches. So in 24 hours, I'll be on the bridge for eight hours. Oh. So that could be at four in the morning, it could be at four in the evening. Eight so hours, three, eight. three, eight hours. Are there many romances on board? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's amazing. But it's almost as if you treat them as chaps and they treat you as chaps. Really. Just colleagues, really. We all yeah. treat each other, you know. I don't mind if I'm on watch with a male officer or a female officer. You know, it's just work at the end of the day, really. <laughs> It doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? Yeah, which is nice, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose it is. Yeah. How long do you think you'll stay? It's a career, you know, I joined up for a career. Exactly. Um, and I like, you know, it's quite cool seeing the captain as a professional, his life's work, he knows exactly what he's doing. It would be quite nice to get to that level and be, mm. you know, a proper professional naval officer. For June, this is a world away from life as a Wren in the 1940s. Drinking pink gin with officers aboard a moored submarine was her only experience of a war vessel. And even at the height of the war, women and weapons rarely mixed. What's this, darling? Oh, this is the, um, our 20 mil. So this is our 20 mil gun. They'll fit their shoulders in there. Shoulders? Both shoulders? Yeah, and then you put your hands on there. Yeah. Just on there, and then oh, from yeah. there you can, it won't twist now, but you can yeah. twist it. Yeah, what happens with this hand? That's your squeeze. That will shoot it. It's a trigger. Ah, it's very complicated. I gun. know. <laughs> and it's a very big gun. The breakthrough moment when women first served at sea came with the voyage of the frigate HMS Brilliant. On the 8th of October 1990, the ship set sail with 16 female recruits and its crew. Lieutenant Commander Kate Welch was one of those pioneering women aboard. 
and as June hears her story, she starts to reassess her own views on what a woman's role in the Navy should be. I have a photograph there oh, of the original batch, the first batch of girls that joined. There were 14 girls that joined her uh, in Plymouth Naval Base uh, in October of 1990. Before we joined the ship, we did a seamanship course. We did um, firefighting and basic sea survival courses, first aid training as well, just to give us the, the basics that we needed. And we sailed straight into a, a pretty intensive operational sea training period, um, which is probably the best thing that, that could have happened um, to us and for us. It was a landmark moment for the service, which thrust the group into the limelight. Huge, huge amount of press attention. Well, because huge amount, were. because we were the first. We yeah. were pioneers, I yeah. suppose. Some was very supportive, and, and other elements were not quite so supportive and didn't think it would necessarily work having women on board a floating tin can a I long way like away from that. home. Yeah, I didn't think it was a good idea at all. But actually, for us involved in it, we we weren't there as women. We were there as sailors on our ship doing our job, you know, part of the, the whole ship's company. So and that we felt very strongly about that as well. So we got quite grumpy when we saw some of these reports <laughs> of what we were supposedly doing and could or could not do. You know, we were there in a professional capacity as part of the ship's company well, doing our... Well, you've always got to have two sides. Yes, you have. You've always got to have a discussion. Yes. How did the men actually uh, react to you coming on as well, as their equals in some respect. Mm -hmm. I think there was probably a degree of scepticism to mm. start off with, and um, probably a little bit of doubt that we'd be able to do, do our job, job mm. and do the whole ship task as well, and in that sort of very alien environment to us. Um, but I think the operational sea training that we went into early on sorted us out pretty quickly, and, and it proved, hopefully yeah. proved, to the majority on board that we were up to the job, we could do it. Yes. But before women could serve aboard a ship, there were very practical issues that had to be addressed. They needed separate sleeping quarters, and uniforms had to be redesigned, and not all of that was ready when the ship set sail. They didn't have the right kit for us, so um, we ended up wearing men's uniform and struggling to get boots to fit. I was the fine. Job you were it, was, it was a bit of a struggle. Mm. So I spent, only spent 10 months on board Brilliant, um, but that included service out in the first Gulf War. It's learning to not only form your professional role on board, but also how you perform as a member of the ship's company. Bathrooms were separate as well, so it just put a little bit of pressure on domestic arrangements on board. Did you have guards on the door? No, we just <laughs> scowled at them, it was fine. It was fine. We wore very long dressing gowns with our flip-flops <laughs> back and forth between the mess and the showers. The ship's company quickly adapted to the change as they had to focus on the mission in hand. They were heading to the Gulf to join 15,000 other British servicemen and women who were actively involved in the Iraq conflict. What was your port there? Were you... Well, we were just sailing up and down in the oh, northern Persian Gulf. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we were patrolling out there, supporting the, the civilian or the merchant shipping out there and providing so, although support. although it was a war situation, you weren't involved in... We didn't war. come under, under oh, direct fire. We yeah. occasionally, there was threat of a Scud mis missile attack, so we'd have to close the ship down and, and yeah. prepare just in case. And we exercised all the time just in case we did come under attack. It's always in case, isn't it? Just in case. Yeah. We've got to be prepared. It's clear to June that whether serving in the Gulf War or providing aid to disaster-hit areas, women are now an integral part of Britain's naval forces. And 71 years after her own two years in uniform, she's about to have an opportunity that would have been impossible for any woman in her day, to steer a Royal Navy vessel. Morning, Mum. I'm Oliver Brown. I'm the captain of H.R.S. Call Muncher. me Mum. How sweet. I'd rather be ma'am. Ma'am, yes. I'd be the Queen. <laughs> that is very true. Captain Brown's keen to show June what she's been missing. Why are we swaying? Oh, of course, we're on a boat. <laughs> and here we are. It's funny how you're steering we are nowadays, isn't it? Yes. A, a lot of people are surprised how large it is, considering it's much the same as it always has been. So, HMS Puncher, um, obviously we're one of the smaller ships in the Navy. There's 14 P2000s um, and it's open to everyone. So we've currently got five female um, captains of the ships um, who 
do exactly the same jobs as us and obviously in today's Navy um, they're pushing through and we've got commanders of all sorts of ships and all different backgrounds and experiences. Yeah, so, but you have no opinion about that really because you're young and it just was as, you, as it is now, was, <laughs> as it was when you joined. Yes, very much so. So when you first were in the Navy it was a completely different environment. Now we work side by side. So. Yes. Like every one of the Royal Navy's 70-plus commissioned ships and submarines, this one has an essential role to play. Ultimately, life in the Royal Navy is, is training for a just-in case, and we all hope that we never actually end up doing our ultimate job. But a lot is going on at the moment in the world. Yes, uh, well, at the moment we're, just, we're sending um, HMS Ocean, we've got the RFAs um, and a Type 45 heading over to the Caribbean. Because obviously, uh, on top of the war fighting, we also do the humanitarian relief, so it's showing that global presence, yes. Today, it's June's job to navigate the River Thames, and it's the ultimate example of just how women's roles across all the armed forces have changed. It's quite simple and easy. Um, we'll go around the lock, it's nice and open and clear, um, and everyone will be in safe hands whilst we're on the wheel. Do you want me to? It'd be great to have you do it, so. I thought you yeah. did. Yeah. Do you mind, Lieutenant Creech, if we change places? Yeah, well, I don't okay. mind. So we've got the engines just here, where we can control both of the engines. Yeah. So we've got the positions of slower stern and slower head. So that's now having the engines both go in a different direction, and which slower is... Slower stern is back, backwards. Slower head. Yeah. So you can see now the ship's head is turning slowly. So we'll just let us come left of the boys. Just Am I all right steering over here? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So I if don't you want to go that yeah. way, if you turn the wheel around to the right, yeah, just keep coming further round. In a moment, I'm going to have to. I don't think you say straight enough. I think it's to do with the so car. Steady up. Steady up. Yeah. Once we get to the end, we'll turn all the way around. Right. Yeah. To you two. <laughs> When I started this programme, I had a certain prejudice against the Navy being one, that women and men were just the Navy. I just couldn't see that it could happen. I suppose looking back, that being in the Wrens did enrich my life in a way. I never really realised it. I knew there was freedom about it. And comparing it with today, they also find that it enriches their lives. These people who are no longer wrens, who are just part of the Navy. And I suppose being offered a drive of this offshore patrol boat made me realize that I would have been perfectly capable of doing this when I was young. I have changed. And I have lost a lot of my prejudice. And I can see that the Navy works very well in its integrated form. So it's helped me a lot to accept that society has moved on. And I've had a lovely day today.